Welcome to a fantastic edition of Rebellion's educational series. I'm here with my old friend, Dr. Igor Halperin, one of the smartest minds I've come across in over two decades of machine learning. When Igor was a professor at NYU, he gave a talk maybe in 2012, 2013 on reinforcement learning. And I was quite taken and it was the only talk in the entire conference that actually got me to raise my eyes from my phone. Igor, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so, so much. We're gonna cover three topics today. The investment case for reinforcement learning, inverse reinforcement learning, and the dangers of deep learning. I myself have been burned in deep learning. Um, actually, about 10 years ago this, this uh, month uh, was when I had a deep learning portfolio that uh, ran into trouble. But let's start with reinforcement learning and your feeling on the investment case for that. Uh, well, that's one of the points that I'm trying to present uh, every time I have the opportunity to, to talk is that most of, in my view, most of all problems in finance, uh, they amount to reinforcement learning or to inverse reinforcement learning or to combination of these two. So essentially everything that we do, and I can easily explain why. Well, first, what is the difference between reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning? Right. Yes, that's the that's the important question. Right. So the difference is this: uh, if you know what you want to uh, maximize or optimize, this is your reward. So this is the case for reinforcement learning. So if you know, like, let's say you optimize, I don't know, whatever you want to ma to maximize, like sharp ratio, for example, right? or incremental sharp ratio for this case. Then you have a case for reinforcement learning. So you just, you know, apply one of the techniques, at least in theory, uh, and you, you, you get a great performance, hopefully, right? And uh, this is reinforcement learning, right? So like you can think of a multi-period version of Markowitz portfolio optimization as a great case for reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. So for Markowitz case, it would be like combination of return and risk, which is your reward function. Inverse reinforcement learning is why it's called inverse because it's exactly the opposite of reinforcement learning. This is the case when you see some behavior, right? So you see some, some performance on the portfolio, for example. So you see like the states of the portfolio, you see the kind of what was the market on those dates and you see trades. What you don't see is the motivation, like why a given PM did these trades, right? So you try to rationalize the behavior uh, from the observed data. This is inverse reinforcement learning and these two things can work together. So we actually just published a paper uh, yesterday in RISC on how to combine these two things. Can you summarize it for our viewers today? Absolutely, yes. Uh, so the way to summarize them would be the following. Uh, and there are multiple use cases, right? So as one potential uh, example, we mentioned robot advising, but it can be applied for, you know, for uh, uh, funds, for example, right? The idea is very simple. You take the trading history of, of, of someone or, or, or a fund, people, whatever, right? Of some agents. Uh, and you apply inverse reinforcement learning to that in order to learn what, what was the objective that they were trying to maximize. So you, you, you define the reward function and you, you learn parameters of which reward function. And, and once you did that, you apply reinforcement learning. Could it be possible theoretically to treat the entire market as one agent? Yes, that's exactly what I did in another paper of mine. Yes, that was that was exactly the idea. I, um, I, I read that paper, so that's why I bring it up. Oh, all right, okay, that's great. Yes. Would you expand yes. that for our viewers as well, Igor? Yes, uh, the, the motivation was funny. We just didn't have uh, data. Uh, to try it on individual portfolio. And then I got the idea, what if we apply it for the whole market? Um, yes. Uh, and uh, the results were very interesting, right? So the results gave some insights about how to do market modeling properly, which is slightly different, but very much related topic. 
to the reinforcement learning. So uh, do you think reinforcement learning is, I guess, more important for portfolio optimization or for portfolio management, or do you think they're both important? It's not one or the other. As opposed to what? As opposed to, I guess, where do you think it excels the most? Reinforcement learning? Yes. Um, well, I, I, like my view is that it's a, it's a framework, first of all, right? It's the right language in which we need to frame everything that we do, all right? So the framework is reinforcement learning, right? Then we have a question, okay, what's the place of deep learning, let's say there, right? And I have an answer for this. So yes, so what is the place of deep learning? Uh, to get the signals. So you can use, so you, you see, but that's exactly the way- yeah, I completely working. agree with you. No, I think yeah. you're completely right, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, when given a data set uh, with no prior knowledge, would you want to start with a k-means clustering before you went into a deep learning? To, or do you think that? I mean, do you think deep learning can deal with you know kind of a broad database? Do you think you need a, you know, do you think you need a, a technique before you get into it? Well, <laughs> yes. Your, your your plan was to talk about uh, RL, IRL, and deep learning. So, for the record, I want to state that uh, you know. I'm trying to stay clear of deep learning itself for multiple reasons, right? Yes. We can talk about them. Yes, multiple reasons. Uh, what are your conceptually, points? at least, uh, this is how I see the place of it, right? So the place of it is you have a framework which is which should be based on reinforcement learning because your main objective is to act, is to trade, right? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what reinforcement learning is about, how to trade optimally. Now you trade based on signals and you can use whatever you want, including deep learning, obviously, to extract signals, right? But it's clearly subordinated to the main task. That's, that's, that's how we should think of it. So do you think a deep learning system could run a portfolio consistently against the S&P or do you think it'll just consistently run into trouble? Uh, I, uh, well, uh, fortunately, I didn't have to try to answer this question in what I do. Uh, uh, I, I just don't know. But again, that's because I, I, I don't specifically work on deep learning. Uh, and uh, in general, like everything that I, you know, all everything that I do on that side is subordinated to the main task of, of the enforcement. Well, about 11 years ago, we switched from a deep learning to a reinforced deep learning because we felt that deep learning didn't keep up with uh, the flow of data in the markets and that, you know, deep learning would, you know, capture a perfect portfolio for that time period. But, you know, we felt the, the attrition rate of the alpha of that portfolio was much quicker and it was bad at dealing with you know, kind of changes in the data set. Uh, so, you know, where, you know, reinforcement learning is more topical, you'd agree, more superficial, you know, as it's more concerned, you know, with, you know, giving up something valuable for something more valuable, uh, you know, but in today's market, it's, we're, we're dealing with a very volatile ecosystem that is moving much more quickly than in 2005, 2007. That's right. Yes, that's right. But that's exactly one of the issues. Uh, you see, to me, it's not the difference between uh, deep learning and reinforcement learning, because uh, like from my perspective, uh, there is this thing called deep reinforcement learning, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what most people do in this space, right? And deep reinforcement learning, I think, inherits all the problems of deep learning. Why? because it has too much of flexibility. It's too much of a black box, right? It's too much out of your control. You don't know like something goes in, something goes out. You don't really understand what's happening there. And this is, this is where the danger is, right? Yeah, no, it, if you don't understand the direction of the descent, you're just, it, it's very much a black box. And so- Yes. And so when times change, there will be issues. I, I, you know, going back to the 1987 crash, for instance, you know, I, I don't think in any way deep learning could have uh, uh, 
dealt with that. That was a quick move. But whereas with the 2008 financial crisis, deep learning could deal with it because it was kind of very much a slow freight train crash where, yeah. you know, U.S. Uh, home loans started, you know, tanking in late 06 and Bear didn't go down till March and, you know, of 08. So you had, you know, a good year or two plus of just kind of things slowly hitting the fan. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's get back to, to deep learning. Where do you see deep learning growing outside of finance? Do you, where, where do you see kind of a, a perfect place for it in society? Wow, well, that's a good question. I, 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 I didn't think uh, so far uh, outside of finance. I, I, I'm just trying to make my head inside of finance. Uh, um, I, well, I, I don't have anything against deep learning uh, outside of finance. I just not knowledgeable enough. Yeah. about those applications, but I, I, I think I see the issues with that for finance. Yeah, no, of course. I just, I think that, I think deep learning is a useful tool. I just think it's unfortunately too, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a World War I battleship that's not going to work in World War II. It's, uh, right. Yeah, no, it's it's, a, it's unfortunately uh, you know, too slow. You you know you need to adapt, um, and you don't want to lose ten million men before you adapt. So it's not uh, unfortunately uh, you know, we, we don't want to be Stalin here. Um, but I Igor and I are both from Russia, so we we both share a love of Russian history. Maybe myself even more than Igor, but um, maybe. You know, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> anyway, so getting back to uh, inverse reinforcement learning. Do you see that being useful for individual portfolio managers whose alpha might be decaying as a way of kind of finding what investments made sense for them at a certain period? Let's say, you know, they had good alpha from 16 to 19 and then 20 and 21, they've had negative alpha. Could you see an IRL program creating a portfolio based on their investing? Uh, that's absolutely yes. Wonderful. And I guess my, uh, you know, this has been a, a lot of fun chatting, but I, I, I've got to ask, what do you think is the number one tool that uh, quants right now and aspiring quants should be studying for? Uh, you know, first of all, do you think physics is something that will become more and more important in finance as time goes on? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. And, and even more than that, I actually, I, I think I sense this trend. Uh, recently in the literature so and and i maybe partly went through the same evolution mental evolution that uh, you know once uh, those beautiful tools appeared like deep learning etc right people say oh we some 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 people even said we don't need any theory anymore right so we just data like we throw everything on this beautiful black box it will spit out all the results right but then they, they started to realize, no, actually it's very complex, right? So it's an incredible complexity which goes on in this black box. So we better use you know, traditional tools of math and physics in order to understand better what's going on inside. So now it's kind of you know, the, the other side, the side of this cycle, right? So people try to use more and more uh, mathematical tools and insights from physics to understand better deep learning in particular, right? So most definitely, um, you know, people should, uh, especially schools should, uh, you know, provide better education uh, on, on, on basic physics. I, I, some I, other. Yeah, I, I, I very much agree with you. And I see the market as a, you know, uh, kind of a, a physics problem, a living physics problem. And as you know, technicians embrace physics, they'll, be many more kind of opportunities to create alpha based on guessing the direction. And so, you know, I, I, I've been telling my students to, you know, keep their physics uh, ability strong. So would you rather a student with a strong physics background or a strong programming background? Physics. Uh, my, my uh, because, well, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit uh, like, you know, I came to finance uh, from physics and, and a, a uh, physicists are uh, infamous for their arrogance, uh, like on interviews, like it was very common 
pattern, right? So I did the same mistake, right? On interviews when, you know, when you ask if you know C++, uh, the typical answer from a physicist would be like, oh, like, what's the problem? Like, give me like three weeks and I will know that, right? Because I have experience of reading papers and books. It's not exactly that, right? But still, still, uh, it, it really depends actually on what, what, what you need, right? Because for some certain things, you need a sufficient level of mathematical, you know, background, right? Uh, to, to at least to understand and be able to, you know, read papers and implement them, right? Even this requires some, you know, some level of mathematical techniques, right? On the other hand, like it all depends, right? So if you, it depends on where you are in this chain between research and production, right? And clearly like the more, the closer you move towards production, the more emphasis is on software, software development skills, right? So we don't want, you know, buggy code and, and like, it should be a combination, really. Well, anyway, I hope one day we can work together on doing a paper on you know, the market as an agent. It seems like uh, a tough thing, um, but I, I did enjoy your paper. And I did enjoy talking with you tonight as well, Igor. It's always a pleasure. And I uh, you know, wish you a great summer. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Pleasure is all mine. Talk soon.